All right, I'm Dave Rat, and I am continuing the videos on the Midas M32 versus the X32, looking at the differences. Um, all kinds of great comments have come through. Um, you know, a lot of people out there say they're exactly the same with different shells. Some people say they're vastly different. I've seen extremes on both sides. Today, we're gonna have some fun looking at the oscilloscope. Um, I'm gonna run some signals in and uh, we'll take a look at what comes out. Now, one thing I said in a previous video and I like to repeat is the perfect digital dream is to be a piece of copper wire. Um, digital attempts to emulate what happens with a signal traveling through a copper wire in its purest form. Now, digital offers all these features and assets that you can do, crossovers and filters and um, uh, delays and EQ and mass amounts of manipulation with zero degradation beyond the degradation that you get by converting to digital and back to analog. Those end stops are fixed or they're, you know, they push the limits of them. Um, whether or not it's relevant to extend to a very high frequencies or not, for a certain application, that is for you to determine. We're gonna take a look at the two consoles with various signals. So, if we look over here, I've got a signal generator where I can control uh, the type of waveform going in and a scope. And right now, we're looking at a piece of wire. It's coming out of the signal generator, going into a four-way split. One uh, way is going into the Midas M32, one way is going to the X32, one way is going into the Behringer Zinix, and one way is going straight into the scope. Also, I've seen comments where someone's like, you're testing these consoles, you're going into the Zinix, you're degrading the sound by going into this cheap analog board coming from these also not super expensive, uh, various price range digital boards. Um, think about that. It's very easy to make an analog piece of gear that passes a very wide frequency response and it's very challenging and a lot more expensive to do that in the digital domain. Although, uh, well, let's go ahead and check it out. So in any case, um, I'll bring this up and we can see this is a 1000, no, nope, a 100 hertz sine wave coming directly out of the signal generator into the scope. If I fire up trace number two, there's a green trace and I can spread it out a little bit and you can see that's the trace coming out of the analog console and you can see that it's a very slightly offset probably a phase shift of some sort if I change the base on that it'll alter it uh, there's a slight offset it's not necessarily a time offset as much as a phase offset but uh, we'll just leave it at that so there is the um, direct piece of wire and the analog board with 1000 cycle tone. Oh, on this screen, if you look right here, 100 hertz tone, you'll see it's the frequency of the tone is written there. And then the frequency is here. This is a sine wave and hopefully all this comes out and you'll be able to see it. Um, let's go ahead and fire, we'll take out the analog trays and we'll fire up the M32. I believe that here, if I mute this channel. Nope, I'm sorry, that is the X32. So the um, pinkish purple, pinkish color is the X32. And here we can see that it's offset. Um, that would be the latency of the console. And if we look at the sweep, it's a one millisecond sweep rate. A square is about one millisecond. So we can, um, not a very long latency. It appears to be about a millisecond. Um, yeah, but it's not a lot of time. Not a lot of time. Very quick, but still milliseconds about a foot. Now I'm going to fire up the third one, which is the green one. And here we can see that piled right on top of the pink one. And now if I fire up all four, we have the four waveforms at 100 hertz. Let's go ahead and take a look at a square wave. So I'm going to turn off the various bits here. And there we have a 100 hertz sine wave. 
And if I go to the waveform here, I should be able to go to square wave. And there it is. There's a square wave at 100 hertz in the direct piece of wire. Beautiful. It's, this is what's coming out of the signal generator. It's nice and square. It's crisp all the way through. Let's go ahead and look at the Xenix and see the quality of its ability to reproduce a square wave. And here, if I turn off the initial signal, we can see that the square wave has kind of a ramp down. Um, it's unable to reproduce the DC component that is the flat at the top, so it goes up and drops down. Let's spread that out a little bit. Oh, now, square wave is very difficult to reproduce. The high frequencies required to make that corner sharp um, can be significant. Let's go ahead and fire up the X32. And here we can see that it overshoots and it rings a bit as it drops down. And let's try the M32, which shows up almost exactly on top of the M32. And I can take that out so we can... Those are the two digital boards. There's the analog board. I will just use the M32 for this. And there we got it. There we have it. So now if I spread these out, we can kind of take a look at the difference between these waves. So what I'll do is I'm going to go up in frequency. And I'll line them up on top of each other. And here we can kind of see really what's happening with these square waves. Now they're out of time, so they're, they're kind of shifted, but you can see that the um, analog board here is nice, crisp, and square. And if I go to the original signal, it's nice and square. And the digital board overshoots, rings, and drops down. Uh, and then overshoots again. Uh, the inability to reproduce a square wave probably is not uh, that big of a deal. I mean, does it really need to reproduce a square wave? Um, don't know, but it does show that it does not have the frequency response. Let's go ahead and go back to the uh, cheap analog board. Does a heck of a lot better job at reproducing a square wave than either of the digital consoles. Um, let's go further into this. Now, here's something interesting. If I turn off the original, this is just the um, two digital consoles. And if I bring them out, we can see that, um, we can see that um, they're not right on top, they're slightly offset. And that is because there is a different latency in the X32 than the M32. The M32 has a slightly shorter latency, very, very slight. The latency shift at 25 microseconds per division is about four of the five divisions, so it's about 20 microseconds um, less latency in the Midas M32. Uh, how does that affect us? Um, Probably doesn't. Who cares? You know, it's uh, 25 microseconds is a very small amount. We can actually look and see what frequency this would mess with. So if I go over to like back to sine wave and if we go here, we can actually raise the frequency of the um, generator until we see what frequency we get 180 degree phase shift on it. Um, so I'm raising it up and at 20k so it's somewhere above 20k and there we're up um uh, look at that fun Wee! Uh, that's what's happening at um 24k on the two digital consoles um and we get up to that i believe the nyquist frequency um there we are at um 23k and we're almost 180 degrees out of phase so that point uh, that 20 microsecond phase shift if you were to run a signal onto this board a signal on this board and mechanically sum them through hard wires you could get some problems but who cares about it, it doesn't make a difference um let's see so we saw that oh we saw what happened at 24k with these two consoles um it's interesting there got different frequencies different um uh, effects there 
Let's see how the analog console deals with that same frequency. And look at that. It is rock solid at 24K. It um, has no problem with that frequency. Now let's go up farther. Let's go up to 25. Now at 27K, both cons, both the digitals are gone. They, they, they're not going to have anything to do with that. They're not even interested in trying. Uh, whereas this inexpensive little Behringer console, um, all three consoles are Behringer, um, has no problem doing it. And we're going up to 35, 38, 40K, 50. Uh, we're going way up there. Uh, we're up to 100K and we still got some signal coming out of this thing. Wow. Um, good stuff. So um, it goes up very high. Well, that should manifest itself. The fact that it's able to go very high should manifest itself in the ability to reproduce a square wave. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. And a uh, square. Boop. And we can go down in frequency to... Let's get our frequencies here. This is a thousand hertz. And let's go up to 20K. And there's our various waveforms at 20K. Fun. Uh, let's get the red, yellow one in there. Uh, it looks like a mess, so let's do them one at a time. There's what we're sending to the three consoles, the uh, piece of wire. And the analog board is reproducing the piece of wire with that. Um, we're seeing a slight amount of phase shift or delay there. Um, and it's rounding off the front there a bit. Uh, let's see how the digital console, there's the X32 has decided that the square wave is not what it wants to do. It will do a sine wave instead. And the M32 will also do a sine wave and it will do it um, a little earlier. Um, it's at a 10 microsecond delay here. So we're seeing 10, about 20 microseconds, actually about 18 microseconds I'm looking at. Um, again, digital consoles um, are not a piece of wire, and the analog console does a much better job at it, which is why during these tests I'm kind of nonchalantly using an inexpensive analog console because I know it can easily perform or match the performance of what these digital consoles are trying to do, at least for the tests that we're doing and anything that you'll be able to hear on YouTube, which even further degrades the performance. If you haven't seen it, I did a couple videos or two or three videos on YouTube that um, actually test the frequency response of YouTube in mono and stereo, um, test the high frequency limit and the low frequency limits. Um, so it might be worth checking out if you're interested in the limitations for the videos that I play sound on. Um, what else do we got to do here? So we showed some latency between the two, uh, the couple, you know, not very much, but um, uh, I am looking at differences. Uh, we looked at the difference between the analog console and the digital consoles. We looked at how they deal with square waves. And really the focus of this was um, for all the power of digital consoles, not just these, but any digital format all the power, flexibility, and versatility that we gain, it's important to remember that the perfect piece of digital gear still to this day cannot perform as well as a piece of wire, not even close. And an inexpensive analog board can get a heck of a lot closer to that. Um, question is how do these performance differences impact what we hear and what is the relevance of that? Um, should we discount it? Hey, it's up there, who cares? Or are there ramifications that uh, show up as airiness or show up that we can perceive and um, we can definitely measure, but are they perceivable? Um, did another video where I showed that uh, 40K tone can be perceived it with my daughter, Sammy. Um, and if you haven't done it, next time you're in a swimming pool or in a bathtub or scuba diving, plug your ears and have someone 
clack some rocks together. If you're scuba diving, listen to the fish biting the coral if you're out there. Um, or just listen to splashing around. And with your ears plugged, you'll notice that you do hear ultra high frequency sounds radiated through your skull, not coming in through your eardrums. Um, other tests can show that you can hear ultra high frequency sounds not using your eardrums directly into your skull. You can hear it if you rub your hand back there. Um, so there's a good probability that we are able to, not a good probability, we're definitely able to perceive things in multiple ways. We can perceive vibration of the ground to an earthquake or vibration or the rocking of a boat at one hertz, which is way below what we can hear. We can perceive heat, light, which are frequencies way above what we can hear. And there's sonic related frequencies, either vibrational or otherwise available to us that our bodies do perceive. So don't put hard stops on what people can and can't do. Um, but definitely important to look at relevance um, and application. Um, sonic realism is only important for a very small sliver of things that we do. Um, so don't get too hung up on that either. Does it really need to be perfect or does it just need to be fun, intense, or memorable? All right. Cool, cool. Um, Thanks for joining.